record. Okay, now then. Question number one is, heater coolant circulates through everything except the radiator, right? Now the radiator, in other words, they got heater core, water jacket, radiator, cylinder head. So you know it's going to go in the water jacket, right? You know what the water jacket is? Yes, awesome. That's where the water is all around the motor. Hey, let me ask you this. Do you know how to do you know how to drain the water jacket? You drain the water jacket. Like you, do you drain the radiator? Is there water still sitting in the in water the jacket? Yeah, yeah. the water still sitting in the box. <laughs> no. On a lot of engines, there's a plug. It's in the bottom of the water jacket. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you take that little pipe plug out, yeah, whatever it is, and it'll, yeah, you drain the block. Yeah, you know, you know that? Commercial. Now, most of the time, mechanics don't ever do that. Uh, but I knew this guy one time that had this little Iron Duke engine that I sold. He, and he had that thing all built up. Yeah, it's a little uh, four cylinder, cast iron four cylinder in Chevrolet. And, uh, and he drained the radiator, but he didn't drain the block. And it froze in his shop and it busted the block. You know, all that up. Yeah. Yeah. All right, technician A says that oat coolant, you guys pay attention now, the oat coolants are based on propylene glycol. Technician uh, B says that oat coolants stand for her hybrid organic acid technology. Who's right about that? Huh? You got no idea? Sounds possible. What? Organic acid technology and hybrid organic acid technology. You see, closing bolt bins, I'm going to show you there's a, there's a thing around it. There's a uh, antifreeze chart. See an antifreeze chart right there? You guys? Over there. See? That's really somehow when you post stuff like that, it's right there in front of your face and nobody ever looks at it. Now, Brandon, does that give you pretty good information on that? Oh, it's nice to say you don't mix the propylene glycol and ethylene glycol. Yeah. That's that chart right over there I'm talking about. I got it posted. I got posted, but for some reason or another, everybody just ignores it. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in on it right now. Some if you mix them, supposed to gel up or something. It'll blow up. Boom! It's actually going to cause it to. It's actually going to cause it to get all you know clogged up or crud. Basically, is what it is. There's your any cleans application chart. Pretty good stuff over there, huh? Okay. Huh? All right. If you run straight antifreeze, you'll bust your block. Well, it's not going to work as good as a water and antifreeze mix. All right. Or you'll bust the head usually. So That's technician B, all a hybrid organic te acid technology. You need to memorize all that kind of stuff because it will be on some pop tests and things. All of the following are examples of heat exchangers except A, thermostat, B, heater core, C, evaporator, D, condenser. A thermostat. Thermostat is not a heat exchanger. Heat exchanger going to carry the heat out. In other words, you got fins on it typically. Coolant heat storage system is being discussed. Technician A says the water valve. Oh, now wait a minute. We're talking coolant heat storage system. Have you ever heard of that? No. Like on that Toyota that's, that stores the heat. Bingo! Listen to him. Listen to us. Yeah. He comes up with good answers. Look at that. It's got a little, I, I showed you guys this. It's got that little silver thermos bottle under the fender. You didn't show me. Yeah. You didn't show me. Huh? No. That, well, you guys weren't paying attention. Now, how did you know about this? It was on the uh, thing we did. It was on that video I showed, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, where well, y'all weren't paying attention, were you? Oh, y'all were sleeping. The lights were off. I forgot. Okay. They were pulling a Brandon. Huh? They were pulling a Brandon. They were pulling a Brandon. They were looking at it. They were saying, yeah, but he remembered that. You see what I'm saying? You guys focus, because I showed you that coolant thing. Huh? Yeah. Uh, there was a video that I showed you. About, about two or three weeks ago. Yeah, it was. It was early, it was early in this hybrid class. I showed you the video. On those little Toyotas. Those little oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that old man talking? Oh. That old man. That yeah. Was. Was a little, actually, that wasn't that one. It was another one. It was from Toyota, actual Toyota uh, footage stuff, you know, they did. And it showed a little thermos thing over on the side, and it's about this big around. It's a thermos bottle. And it's supposed to keep the engine cool, warm, actually, the head cylinder head warm for as much as two and a half to three days. But what we were able to gather when I was at hybrid school, they, they were saying, even if a car has been sitting on the lot for a day or two, be really careful when you're doing anything. Whenever you're doing anything, you guys are being really disruptive. But uh, whenever you're doing anything, make sure that you don't burn yourself. 
Well, what we were doing over at the school, one had been sitting there for about a day and a half, and when we let the water come out of it, it was just lukewarm. So what I mean is, I don't think that thing is quite what it's cracked up to be, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm really serious. I mean, I don't think it is, but they claim that it's supposed to store heat for several, you know, it's, it's a thermos is what it is, you know, and even a, even your coffee thermos is not going to keep it warm, you know, for very long. Okay, but anyway, the coolant heat storage system being discussed, technician A says a water valve is driven by an electric motor. Is he right? Remember? Oh. Technician B says a storage tank has its own electric water pump. Both of those guys are right. Remember that? You don't you remember that little diagram where that they showed that little water valve turning? I remembered the valve and, and all, but I didn't remember anything about electric motor. Well, I, I, you actually saw the uh, animation of it turning, but it, we, I didn't talk about it being an electric motor. Now, this chapter would have told you that. Okay. All of the air entering the passenger compartment has got to pass through what? Evaporator. Evaporator. Yep. It doesn't always pass through the heater core because if the blend door got the heater core closed off, it's not going to go through it. Scan data indicates the starter generator control module on a GM hybrid pickup has overheated. The least likely cause would be A, faulty electric pump, B, low coolant level, C, an operative fan, or D, stuck, therm stuck, stuck thermostat. Not going to be a stuck thermostat. Will not be a stuck thermostat. So that's going to be the. That's that. going to be the answer. Ain't no whole bit of thermostat. That's just the least likely cause. Sounds like. It's eight. not likely to be that. It's more likely to be an operative fan, low coolant level, faulty electric pump. Uh, you know, it's not likely to be a stuck thermostat. And uh, for 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 more information on that, your textbook will give you that information in detail. I'm not going to take the time to go over right now, but I will tell you that those uh, some of those GMs that had 36 volt systems on them. And they had a great big old starter generator with a huge belt on it down there on the front of the motor. And when you would stop at a traffic signal, the engine would die. And then whenever you go to give it the gas, that big starter generator would fire the motor back up. And it was basically just a, so you didn't idle. It was a V8? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you something else. These GMC trucks look just like that one I got sitting out here. They make the hybrid versions of that. It's got two great big electric motors in the transmission. Really cool stuff and all that. All the air entering the passenger the compartment has got to pass through the evaporator. We've already been there. Scan data. A local, a Excuse me. Seven is a question we should be on. Technician A says that a positive temperature coefficient heater can be built into a conventional heater core assembly. Now, this is hybrid stuff we're talking about, guys. Technician B says, huh? Uh, technician B says a positive temperature coefficient heater's electrical resistance will decrease as its temperature increases. Which technician is correct? Uh, What's a positive temperature coefficient? What's that mean? That means the hotter it gets, the more resistance it gets, right? Okay. What did, what did technician B said? What did he say? Technician B was wrong. Right, he was backwards. All right, technician A is the right one on that one. All the following statements about hybrid electric vehicle AC compressor compressors are true except which one? Some use only an electric motor without a belt. Is that true? That's it is not. That's true. Seriously? Yep, that's absolutely true. Yeah. I showed you pictures of it, but you were texting somebody on your phone. All right. Uh, what about uh, most are reciprocating piston designs as opposed to what? Chelsea, what did you take apart the other day? That was not. A, they didn't have pistons in it. Remember? Huh? Yeah, scroll compressor. Yeah, scroll compressor. There you go. That's what. That was. That's the answer I'm looking for. Okay. Uh, some use a belt drive along with an electric motor. Non-conductive refrigeration oil must be used with AC compressors utilizing an electric drive motor. Yeah, that. Uh, you know what that oil is? That non-conductive. Uh, the refrigerant oil. They don't want the refrigerant oil eating the insulation off the wires inside the compressor, but it's going to be in there with them. So you have to use an oil, the last I heard, was ND11. That's what you're supposed to use on hybrid air conditioning systems. Air conditioner oil smells just like cooking oil. Huh? Air conditioner Pretty oil. close, yeah, but you're going to have to have, there are different types of it. And you but can't, I mean, it smells just like it. Yeah, it's real similar, you know. As long as it will mix with the refrigerant you're using, you're good. You know, so, so it's C there? Hmm? That's what it's C? Yeah, that, that particular one is uh, B. 
most of them are reciprocating piston designs rather than a scroll or something else. A device used to turn refrigerant flow on and off in an air conditioning system with multiple evaporators is called a what? Multiple evaporators meaning what? When's the last time you saw a vehicle with more than one evaporator? A van. Huh? A van. A van. What else? What about a Ford Escape Hybrid? It's got a separate evaporator back there that cools the battery. If you ever see a Ford Escape Hybrid driving along, you're going to notice that on the left back rear, back right around the back window, you're going to see an air intake. And it creates scoops air that goes down in there through an evaporator and it keeps the battery cool. So it's got a, and it's using the same compressor and all that sort of thing, but, but it's a separate system. What is the optimum operating temperature for an internal combustion engine? Incidentally, uh, Chelsea, whenever I had that Mazda that you're driving fired up with the scan tool hooked up, it was saying it was running about 250 degrees, which is just about really too hot. The gauge was just showing in the middle, though. I want to investigate that, make sure it's full of coolant and all that. Sometimes the, the gauge on the dash will lie to you when it is actually <laughs> overheating. It will. And I've seen that. Uh, and it, I saw it on a Chrysler one time, gauge running right in the middle. I would have sworn that sucker had blown head gaskets because it was making air and all kinds of crap. And it, all it was was a bad thermostat. But the, the uh, you could hear it percolate, and that's how the guy knew he had a problem. But the needle in that, in that gauge never got past the middle. But it was it actually was overheating because the thermostat was what stuck. What was wrong with the gauge? It just wasn't working either that or it had an air bubble. If there's an air bubble there, a lot of times it won't read right. It's got to have cool it. So what was number nine? Uh, number nine was going to be a zone valve. That is a zone valve. Well, an op optimum operating temperature for an internal combustion engine is what? 205. 205. Right. Technician A says that an engine that runs cold as possible will make more power and will therefore last longer. That's still a bunch of nonsense, isn't it? Yeah. Technician B says the purpose of the cooling system is let the engine run as cool as possible. Who's right about that? Neither of those guys are right. Neither of those guys are right. What color is Dex Cool Coolant? Green. Dex Cool, that's uh, that's the orange stuff in there. That's right. He's right, you're wrong. Okay. It's orange. Oh, no. <laughs> he got burned on that or what? Technician A says it's not advisable. Hear me now. Technician A says it's not advisable to add green coolant to a system originally equipped with orange coolant. True. Uh, technician B says when the ice is when the ice what's ice? There you go. When it's in auto stop mode, no coolant circulates because the engine doesn't rotate the water pump. Okay, who's right about that? A. He's the only one that's right. Um, but I will tell you this, um, if you get all of the orange coolant out of it, then you can put the green coolant back in there and it'll be okay. Now, it's not advisable. Manufacturers don't like it. Why do you mean? I mean, what's the difference between? Well, the orange coolant, one of the things that some of the GM guys that I know don't like the orange coolant because it's worse. What's it supposed to do? Uh, actually, the green coolant is supposed to coat and protect everything in that cooling system. This is what I was told in a class a long time ago. The orange coolant is actually supposed to last longer because it only coats the areas that are starting to deteriorate. The orange? That's what I was told a long time ago. Now, I may be totally screwed up about that, but that's what I was taught in a class that I sat in a long time ago. It only coats the thing. Like if some part of the engine is starting to rust or starting to suffer from electrolysis, it will only coat that part of it and leaves the rest of it alone while it's also carrying heat. And it's supposed to last 100,000 miles. And I will tell you this: this yellow coolant that I put in, that I had in my Ford pickup truck, uh, went a hundred thousand miles, and I changed it because you were supposed to. But when I got that coolant, when I drained that coolant out of there, you know, when I pushed it out, it looked like brand spanking new yellow coolant. It hadn't changed color in any way, shape, or form, and it had been in there a hundred thousand miles. Now they aren't just supposed to be environmentally safer, and I do know that dogs won't drink the ones. I don't know if it's environmentally safer, but. Mm -hmm. I do know that dogs won't drink it. So if you got a shop like that has a dog in the shop, you know, they'll here. lick down some green antifreeze. Yeah, they like it because it's sweet. <laughs> yeah, I'm toxic because they yeah. use the, the main ingredient. Because they I have just don't think it tastes it. good. If you ever get the orange in there, it's a better taste. Whereas the green is, if it hits your mouth, but it's a sweet sugar cane taste. Mm -hmm. Well, the green's also a sweet taste too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the orange is the green. Is. Yeah. 
Because they know they use the main ingredient from the orange as a preservative and like uh, coconut for baking and stuff like that. Well, they also, a propylene glycol and ethylene glycol are the two yeah. different things and all that kind of stuff. And you know, I've seen you guys, I've seen you guys, them flies are giving you all the hard time. Yes, they are. They usually don't, they usually stay away from over there if you're not playing with your cell phones. So. Yeah, all right, there you go. <laughs> all right, now the intact. Let's see. What are the fins and radiators and heater cores? Why are they long and flat? So air can pass through them and dissipate their heat. surface area. So more air can pass through them and dissipate their heat, both A and B. Now, when that heat's being dissipated, is that convection, conduction, or radiation? What's going on? What's going on there? The heat's just kind of out of the mind, and I guess it's kind of like it's just radiating out and going to wherever anything is cold. <laughs> That's not such a bad thing. Well, what it's basically doing is what's flowing through the radiator? Hot water. Hot water. So the hot water is contacting these tubes in the radiator, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, isn't that oh, conduction? Good. You know, convection is when you convey the heat away, right? So you pick up the heat in the cylinder head, you convey it through conduction, you convey it through the hoses to the radiator, and through conduction it also goes into these tubes, and then through, uh, and then through convec you know, convection, it's conveyed away by the air, okay, basically. Okay. Got it? So the air conveys it away after it's conducted. So you got conduction and convection working together. Now, radiation is actually heat from the sun or heat from the, you know, the infrared heater. You know, when these infrared heaters are on and you're, and you're blistering the back of your neck when you're trying to work on the car, that's radiation heat. I have it mixed up on that one. And then whenever you take a cold rag and you put it on the back of your neck to get rid of this heat that the heater does, that is what? That's conduction, isn't it? And it's being conveyed into the rag and then it dissipates. Whatever. I mean, that was, that's fun to use those words, but uh, and I want you all to be able to use them uh, you know, you may have a verbal exam where you have to do those uh, on top of you having no notes. Could you do that? Uh -huh. Yeah. Don't get a deer in the headlights look at me over there. Okay. I could. All right. Okay. Technician A says, most heat transfer happens when there's a large difference in temperature between two objects. What do you mean? If I put a hot, if I put a cold milk jug next to a hot a thing of tea, you know, or jug of tea, what's going to happen? They're going to trade off temperatures. They are, but what's moving? The heat. The heat's moving. The heat it's leaves the tea and goes in. So, yeah, you're going to see heat transfer like that, right? Okay, technician B says the highest engine emissions typically occur during cold startup before the engine reaches its operating temperature. Both of those guys are right. That's the highest emissions. That's one of the reasons we have the air management system on there. Technician A says because of hybrid technology, Internal combustion engines are running hotter at peak operating temperature. Technician B says, positive temperature coefficient coolers located in the AC system are used to overcome this excessive engine heat. Technician, neither one of those guys is right. All right. These are, now, the reason we do so many Technician A and B questions is that's what they do on ASC. How many of those did you have when you took your test? Uh, on the ASC research, yeah. The... Some of them are 20, some are 25. Yeah, so I mean, what I'm saying is how many technician A and B questions, what percentage now? Because I've seen them for years. God, it was probably like 70% more. Technician A and B. Oh, yeah, yeah. NADC. They're trying to prepare you for that. But like I said, the one thing, it was about every single one of the research, there was like five questions of electrical on every one of them. Even like the manual transmissions. Yeah, like five electrical. You know, we had the electrical diagrams on like the clutch switch. So I mean, oh, if you don't have a good foundation electrical, you're gonna miss five you questions. You're, you're, gonna, you're probably gonna crash and burn in an automotive career if you don't have a good foundation in electrical. <laughs> you better know electrical stuff because yeah. there's more electrical now than there's ever been. So hey, when I'm teaching this stuff, you better soak it up. You understand me? Hey, there I am. Jesus. <laughs> Well, that fly is not going anywhere. Is it? Okay. He did. All right. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's hurry up. I'm going to show. I'm going to show y'all what. I'm going to show y'all everything Chelsea did when she was on her road trip here. So we got to get through this. Okay. Yeah. Now let me see. Technician A says when liquid changes to a vapor, heat is absorbed. Is that right? Skip one. Is heat absorbed when liquid changes to a vapor? Yeah. Yes. If I've got boiling water here, 
Well, if, if I got water boiling at sea level, what's the temperature of that water? Water boiling at sea level. 212. 212. 212. And I'm going to also measure the temperature of the steam that's coming off that water. What's the temperature there? I don't know if it's hotter than that. No, 212. The steam is 212 and the water is 212. But as the water is transferred into steam, it's absorbing heat. As the water does? As the water does. Okay, how many BTUs does it take? I don't know. I don't understand the BTUs. British thermal unit is about like is. a burning match. Huh? I know what it is, yeah. but I don't understand it. BTUs. That's a way of measuring heat is what it's about, right. it's about to. But if uh, how many BTUs of heat does it take to turn one pound of water into vapor? I said one. No. It needs to, it, one is how long, how much it takes to raise it one degree Fahrenheit. Oh, that's nice. Are you going to raise it one degree Fahrenheit and turn it into vapor? I don't vapor. think so. 972 BTUs of heat it takes to turn one pound of water into vapor. Into vapor. Now, have you noticed we're talking about pounds and Fahrenheit in yeah. British thermal units because the British use pounds. And they also, yeah, that's fine. I think we need to go over Now, is 16 ounces of water weigh 16 ounces of weight? Hmm? The six, if the 16 ounces of water weigh a pound? Fluid ounces or weight ounces? Fluid ounces, that's what I'm talking about. Does it weigh a pound? Man, that's a little different than... Uh, Where do you think they got that standard? Maybe it came from fluid Okay, ounces. somebody give me the answer to that later. Right. Don't. We know a lot, a lot, a lot. Let's do the math here, right quick. And we like we need to do math in here. A gallon of water, a gallon of water, eight weighs eight pounds. Exactly, it does. Okay, so how many gallons? How many? How many? Uh, how many pints are there? It's like hundred and forty. How many pints are? There? How many pints are there in a gallon? Two pints makes a quarter, right? Eight. Uh -huh. My goodness, it sounds to me like it sounds to me like a pound of water is sixteen ounces. In 16 ounces a pint? Yeah. Eight pints to a gallon? Eight pints to a gallon? Eight pounds to a gallon. <laughs> okay, see, I'm just leading you to it. You got it? Okay. <laughs> you did. I'll let you answer your own question. Okay. All right, now technician say, well, let's see. Technician B says when a vapor changes to a liquid, heat's released. Hello? Yeah. Yes. When a vapor changes to a liquid, why does your tea glass sweat. Condensation. Yeah, you've got moisture in the air. It's giving up heat and turning into vapor. <coughs> I mean, turning into water on the side of that glass. Automotive AC compressor oil is hygroscopic. What does that mean? Wait, wait, wait. What was 17? What? 17. 17 was technician B. I'm sorry. I should have said that. Technician A says the high voltage batteries in all hybrid electric vehicles are cooled and maintained at the same temperature as the engine's cooling system. No. Technician B says many hybrid vehicle electric voltage systems are water cooled by separate cooling systems that operate much the same way. Yes. You know. Now, this, the battery is never fluid cooled. It's that, gonna confuse you there if you're not careful. The electronics that operate the transmission, the inverters and all, they will be fluid cooled. The batteries are never, never, never fluid cooled. The batteries are always air cooled. You understand that? And the best temperature for the battery to operate is about room temperature, like right here. Okay? And you know it's always supposed to operate within a range of like, you know, 40 to 80 percent is basically the output. Okay. Never supposed to be charged more than 80 percent or go less than 40 percent. Some of these uh, hybrid batteries, when they get real hot and all, the, the, uh, some of them like uh, car batteries have to steal the water in them. Shut up, Archie. Yeah, uh, hybrid batteries don't have any fluid in them. They're electrolytes at different time. You know, so. They're kind of like an automobile battery, right? Yeah, they've actually, I've got this uh, battery out here that I'm going to have us, we're going to take it out of there and we're going to pull it apart. You'll miss that because you're going to be over there. But anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's got all of these, it's got a bunch of 8-volt batteries. It's got uh, 28 8-volt batteries all wired up in series. And over at the hybrid school that I went to over there at, when I was at KC Vision, uh, what we had to do in that hands-on hybrid class is we took the battery out of the toy, out of these cars, and we pulled the cover and everything off of them, and then we had to actually draw a picture of the battery and how it was wired up and all that. Pretty cool. I mean, and the relays and all that. Because what happens in a hybrid, you got three relays, 
back there in that battery, right? And those three relays, what happens is one of those relays turns on first because it's wanting to see if anything's shorted anywhere. And if nothing is shorted, then it turns on the other two relays. Got it? Yeah. That's just basically the way it works. That's a little rundown. Of it. As a matter of fact, I've got a, uh, I've got a cool little thing right here that I got for that. And I, I made, I mean, I brought, I got a copy of this for you guys. See this? That is a little schematic of the hybrid battery. See that? That's how it works. You see, you got three relays there, and you got a little resistor. That makes sense. The three little relays with the little resistor, and that little resistor is like right here. And what it's going to do, it turns on one. It turns on that one relay, so it can see if there's anything shorted anywhere. And if it sees anything shorted anywhere, it shuts everything right back down. That's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. So there's a third fluid right Matter of fact, when Michael starts taking in hybrid stuff, he'll probably make you his hybrid specialist. Okay. Automotive AC compressor is hygroscopic, which means it absorbs moisture quickly. What else do you know of that's hygroscopic? What else on a car is hygroscopic that absorbs moisture quickly? Yes. Brake fluid. Brake fluid is hygroscopic. Okay. When the internal combustion engine shuts off and the engine coolant temperature is reduced, what component compensates for the drop in pressure inside the closed cooling system? The vacuum valve and the radiator cap. It's the same way it is on a regular car. What's the vacuum valve look like, y'all? You know what it is? If I was asking you what the vacuum valve on a radiator cap was, you ought to be able to explain it to me real quick. The little part on the very bottom that you pull in this little spring loaded. And you pull it down, the little round part in the middle. That's the vacuum valve. Okay. And that was during ice operation, in other words, ice operation being internal combustion engine, when the coolant expands and pressure in a closed coolant system increases, what component allows excess pressure to vent? That would be the pressure relief valve on the radiator cap. That's the big spring. Which of the following is not a current automobile radiator design? Cross flow, down flow, regenerative flow, or all of these are designs? You ever heard of regenerative flow? There's a good reason for that, because it's the one that's not a normal, not a current design. A technician A says coolant fans don't control engine temperature as precisely as an engine-driven fan with a thermostatic fan clutch. Technician B says some electric coolant fans use pulse width modulation to control airflow across radiator fans. Technician B's right. Technician A says the coolant heat storage tanks in some hybrid electric vehicles are made of inner and outer casing with pressurized gas between them for insulation. Technician B says those storage tanks contain a vacuum. You gotta put a vacuum in there. You're not gonna pressurize gas. Come on. Now we'll tell you this. You know these it's windows, not. these windows that is these double and triple pane windows that you get for houses nowadays. They will have argon gas in between those panes. What? Yeah. They like to have argon gas in between those panes. No, they don't have that. They don't have much pressure. They don't have all that much pressure, but they are charged up with argon gas in between. They get argon kits up there. No. No, okay. No, no, no. We're going to get it. I'm thinking about it. One thing I am shocked at is how they don't have, like, because I know, like, with neon lighting, they use neon for, like, your yellows, and they use argon gas for your blues. And it's, I mean, talking about it's, like, a natural blue, and I'm, I don't know how they don't do it without having, like, a blue tint or a blue yeah. hue. Well, whenever you charge it up with the, with the electrons, it gives off blue lights, you know, basically what it amounts to. But, uh,. Anyway, I just my son was doing a, a research paper on that for high school one time, and he actually found out that argon gas is in between those glass panes when they, they, when they make, the, make the manufacture the windows, you know. Um, That's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. All right, let's see. Why is coolant, leak store, coolant heat storage tank used on some hyperelectric vehicles? It's supposed to warm the engine very quickly after cold starts, and that reduces exhaust emissions. Uh, technician A says the amount of heat the conventional passenger climate system can provide depends on the temperature of the coolant flowing through the heater core. That's true. Technician B says hybrid electric vehicle designs, some of them, allow heat from the electrical systems to be circulated in the passenger compartment. Both those guys are right. Oh, and number 27. All of these statements regarding hybrid electric vehicle component using cooling, me, cooling systems are true, except A, the heat exchanger for these systems is located at the front, B, most of the systems use thermostats to regulate coolant flow. C, some of them circulate coolant flow the entire time the ignition is on. And all of these are true statements. No, it's B. B. That one is a B. All right, now, give me a second here. I'm going to pull up this uh, recording that we made because 
She was having an issue with the truck not having good power. Is that right, Chelsea? Yeah. Sometimes you're losing power. You know what I found if, it, if, it, if that thing was telling me the truth? I saw a while ago earlier that the mass airflow sensor doesn't seem to be recording airflow correctly. If my, if my tool was, you know, and you got four files, right? Mm -hmm. How many times? Mm 